All right. I'm so glad. Wow, we have such a packed house today. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Let us stand and sing together hymn number 600. in glory, looking o'er life's finished story, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then how much I owe. When I hear the wicked call on the rocks and hills to fall, when I see them start and shrink on the fiery deluge brink, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then how much I owe. When I stand before the throne, dressed in beauty, not I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart. Then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then how much I owe. When the praise of heaven I hear, loud as thunders to thee, Loud as many waters noise, sweet as harps melodious voice, then Lord shall I fully know, not till then how much I owe. Chosen not for good in me, wakened up from wrath to flee. Hidden in the Savior's side By the Spirit sanctified Teach me, Lord, on earth to show By my love how much I owe Our text this afternoon is John's Gospel, chapter 8 and verses 48 to 59. John 8, 48 to 59. The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and the prophets also, and you say if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, 
I am. Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I was just saying before we began how every time I come to the end of a chapter of John's Gospel, I always feel a little bit sad inside. This is the end of chapter 8. Will I ever preach through chapter 8 ever again? Makes me sad because every single passage, every single word is so full of divine truth and living words. And I know we're not at the end of the gospel yet. We're just over a third of the way through. Um, but I've learned so much so far about who God is, who Jesus is. This is perhaps, I mean, in my estimation, the most evangelistic book of the entire Bible is the Gospel of John. It's so evangelistic because verse after verse, section after section, it shows us who Jesus really is and why we must trust in him, why we must believe in him. We come to this End of John 8 today, where Jesus finishes the chapter by saying the most stupendous thing that he says about himself thus far in maybe the entire Bible, where he declares that he is the great I am. But I don't want to steal my own thunder. So then, let's look at verses 48 to 50. The Jews answered and said to him, We do not, or do we not rightly say that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Well, the last time that we were together, we saw that Jesus told the people who believed him, but did not believe in him, as we saw the difference between verse 30 and verse 31, there were people in verse 30 who believed in Jesus in the crowd based on the words that he was saying. He was not doing miracles in the temple. He was preaching the good news about himself. And there were people in the crowd who were listening who believed in him. But there's this other group within the crowd who believed certain things that he said, but did not put their faith in Christ. And uh, he said to them that he who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. That's exactly what Jesus was speaking to these people, the words of God. They would not hear the words of God because they were not of God. They did not belong to God, even though they were the physical descendants of Abraham, even though they said that they were God's children, they were not actually God's children because... They thought that they had the benefits of belonging to God simply by nature of their fleshly heritage. Yet what does John say at the beginning of his gospel? He says, children born not of the flesh, nor of the will of man, or, or not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's how we become children of God. It's not because we have a godly heritage. And then in the next moment, this crowd proves that what Jesus says is true of them. The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? What gross blasphemy is displayed here? Here are two satanic insults against Jesus that these people vomit out of their mouths. The first is that they call Jesus the worst epithet they can think of. You Samaritan, you. Well, see, we, we, perhaps it is lost on us how much of an insult that they thought that was. What a burn they thought that was to say that about Jesus. 
Um, Samaritans were so hated by the Jewish people, especially the Jewish leadership, that if they wanted to go into Galilee from Judea, they would go far out of their way to avoid Samaria, as we learned way back in John chapter 4. Jesus did not avoid that place, but he went there and he ministered, and the entire town of Sychar came out, and perhaps even all of them came to believe in Jesus because of the testimony of the Samaritan woman whom Jesus forgives and gives living water to in chapter 4. It's so marvelous. But calling Jesus a Samaritan was not only an insult, but it was another way for them to say that they rejected him as Messiah. Because the Messiah is not going to be a Samaritan. He's going to be of the tribe of Judah and a descendant of David. So them saying, aren't you a Samaritan? Is to say, we don't believe in you. And then the second insult that they say is that Jesus has a demon. This is the epitome of blasphemy. Neither the Pharisees nor the common people could repudiate or deny any of the wonderful works of Christ, nor could they repudiate or deny any of the wonderful words of Christ. So instead, they attribute both his words and his works to the demonic. By the prince of demons, he casts out demons, they say in another place. How incorrigible and treacherous these men were. It's not even necessary to say this, but to attribute the goodness of Jesus to the devil is utterly asinine. These people both slander Jesus and they slander the Holy Spirit by their accusations, and they come very awfully close to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And where are they as they say these foolhardy things? I mean, we need to just remember the context, a text without a context, as D.A. Carson used to say in class. A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. That's right. We need to remember whenever we come to a text of the Bible, or really any text of any book whatsoever, that we need to look at it and understand what is the context of the verses that we're reading, of the scripture especially that we're reading. The Lord is there. In the temple which was built for him, it's his living room that they are standing in. They're standing in the living room of the Lord. And they're saying to the Lord of the temple, aren't we right in saying you're a Samaritan and you have a demon? What wretchedness, awfulness is this? It's, it's truly satanic. That's the irony of it. They're claiming that Jesus has a demon when these people are the ones who at least are acting like demons. Mm. I was thinking, the fact that these people are not simply vaporized on the spot. Or that the earth doesn't just open up and swallow them immediately. Is proof positive that Jesus came to bring about the year of the Lord's favor. Like, th that is what he says at the very beginning of his ministry. He brings about the year of the Lord's favor. And so how does Jesus respond to this insolence and defiance? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and who judges. Do you see that? There is one who seeks Jesus' glory, and he judges all who do not honor the Son. This is why the prophet Isaiah pronounces woe on those who call evil good and good evil in Isaiah chapter 5. As a matter of fact, just as a very brief side note, when I was a young Christian man and I was introduced to the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, very early in my Christian walk, which I'm so grateful for. Um, there used to be a, a ministry called the Martin Lloyd-Jones Recordings Trust that would sell his CDs. Now they're all free on mljtrust.org. But, but back at that, in those days, they used to, to sell his CDs. And, and uh, I was delivering pizzas for Tortoreses in Mount Prospect. 
and I would use my pizza delivery money and go on the MLJ Recordings Trust website and from England they would send me CDs of Martin Lloyd-Jones sermons and I would listen to them in the car while I was delivering pizzas. That's how I spent my money and that's how I spent my time after the Lord saved me. Just listening to series of sermons from Dr. Lloyd-Jones. I, I have... I have about 1,500 CDs of his sermons at home. And, and one of the best series of sermons that I listened to very early on in my Christian walk was his series on Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, so if you are free now, you can go online. If you go on mljtrust.org, you can listen to the sermons of Martin Lloyd-Jones on Isaiah 5. They are well worth your time to listen to. They profoundly impacted my soul and really shaped me as a Christian man in so many ways. Um, so I did definitely recommend that. So the prophet Isaiah in chapter 5 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's what they're doing right here. They're calling the sweet Son of God bitter. They're calling the light of Jesus darkness. They're calling the goodness of Christ the work of a demon. Woe to them. Woe to those who do that. They're so twisted in their depravity that when they saw the marvelous goodness of God with their own eyes, they could not recognize it. We see here the darkness of the human heart, the stiff-neckedness of the natural man. And unfortunately, in the following verses, instead of repenting, they dig themselves a deeper hole. Yet, in spite of all of that, Jesus exhibits his supernatural patience in explaining who he really is and why he came into the world. Look at verses 51 to 53. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and the prophets also, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. Are you? Who do you think who do you think you are? Who do you make yourself out to be? Verse 51 contains the most profound truth which Jesus inserts into this disputation, this argument between himself and those who are in the crowd. And he says that anyone who keeps his word will never see death. Isn't that so marvelous? Isn't that the most wonderful thing? Why does he say that here? Because throughout chapter 8, Jesus has been making progressively more and more wonderful statements about himself. Each statement is more wonderful than the statement which came before. In verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In verse 23, Jesus declares, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. In verse 28, he says, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. In verse 36, he says, So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. In verse 42, I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but He sent me. In verse 46, which one of you can convict me of sin? Each statement, each one of those, I just was reading through what we've been looking at for the past couple of weeks and months. Just reading through, line by line, each one of those is building the case that Jesus is the great I Am, that He's God. He's God come in the flesh. That's who He is. 
That's what he declares. That's, that's like the reason, that's the, like, the reason why C.S. Lewis like, so rightly says in his book, Mere Christianity, this trilemma, we must not ever come with some patronizing nonsense about Christ, that he is simply and merely a good moral teacher and nothing else. Because of the things that Jesus says about himself, that then would exclude the idea that Jesus is only a good moral teacher. If he is only a good moral teacher, well, a good moral teacher doesn't lie. A good moral teacher doesn't lie about himself. He's either a liar or a lunatic or he's the Lord of glory. That's the only options that we have. And he proves he's the Lord of glory. He proves it. He proves it. He proves it through his word. He proves it through all of his actions. He proves it through his perfections. He's the Lord of glory. Isn't it the most wonderful thing in the whole world to know him? To know him. To know the perfect man. The heavenly man, the theanthropos, the God-man. We know him. We have relationship, a loving relationship with God in Christ. It's so beautiful. It's so wonderful. It's the best. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite what I withhold. Like, what does this world have? There's nothing in comparison to Jesus. Let me have Jesus. Whom have I in heaven but you? And the earth has nothing that I desire but you. He is the lily of the valley. He is the most wonderful person who ever crossed the horizon of this world. Jesus Christ is. He is the true object of our worship. That's what he shows. Verse after verse after verse after verse. Every single time Jesus opens his heavenly mouth. Every time. He proves his identity. He shows exactly who he is. Again, I, I, like, I keep getting ahead of myself, but as I look here in each of those statements, they're each facets of the, the diamond, the, the great fact that Jesus is the Lord of glory. He's the author of life. He's the resurrection and the life. Every profound declaration that Jesus makes in John 8 displays why the temple guards could not arrest him. This is why they couldn't arrest him. Whoever spoke like this man? Whoever said such things? No one. No one. He speaks perfectly. And he spoke as only God can. So then, what does it mean that anyone who keeps Jesus' word will never see death? I have, I have a friend who died last week who I told you about. And he was a godly man. He loved Jesus. So then, so then what does this mean? I mean, what is death? Perhaps we may only think of death as merely the separation of soul from the body or the stopping of the heart in this world. But that's not the deepest sense of the word. Ultimately, death, as Jesus uses the word here, means separation from God forever in hell. So then, when Jesus says that anyone who keeps his word will never see death, he means that when the believer passes from this world into the next, they actually enter a fuller and far greater spiritual life in the kingdom of heaven with ultimate hope in the resurrection. That's it. It's a far greater life. Therefore, when the New Testament writers speak of the death of Christians, they refer to it as sleep. That's how they refer to it, as sleep. Paul says... To the Thessalonians in chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. He says that those who sleep in the dust of the earth, when the trumpet sounds, they shall rise. They shall rise up. And we shall meet them together in the clouds and so be with the Lord forever. And, and at the end of first. Thessalonians 4, he says, therefore, comfort each other with these words. Comfort. Do not mourn as those who have no hope, as the pagans do. 
Oh, death is the end. The grave is the final resting place. No, it's not. It's not. It's temporary. The grave is a temporary receptacle. And everyone who belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, when the trumpet shall sound, they shall rise from their slumber like a heavenly alarm clock. They shall rise from their slumber and meet the Lord in the air. This is a very, very important thing for us to remember. Uh, one writer put it this way. Jesus never tells his disciples that they will not see the grave. Listen, he never says that. He never says you will not see the grave. But that in the deepest sense, he says you shall never die. Death and life are words that are lifted into a higher connotation so that death is referred to as a moral state, not an event in our physical existence. That's how we are to understand Jesus' words later on in John chapter 11 when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Those verses to me uh, are, are, they're my favorite verses in the whole Bible. John eleven twenty five to 26. Those are my like, my life. People have like a life key verse. Those are my life key verses. John eleven twenty five and 26. Martha is so distraught at the death of her brother. I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I, I know that, Lord. Jesus declares to her, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Whoever dies, if they die in me, they will live. That's it. That's what he's saying. It's what D.L. Moody meant when he famously said, Someday you will read in the newspaper that D.L. Moody is dead. Do not believe it. In that day, I shall be more alive than I am today. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. My friend Mika Cohen, who died last week, is more alive right now in the presence of Jesus than ever he was while he was in the body. That is the truth, actually. That is the truth. And that life... I want to say something else about that. That life is real life. Perhaps we tend to think of heaven as some wispy, ethereal place with transparent ghosts that sit on clouds and strum harps all day and you can kind of see through them and they're like Casper, the friendly ghost. That is how, that is kind of how heaven is portrayed in our culture. But it's only portrayed that way because our culture is not Christian. That's why. That's not what we see in the Bible at all. We must remember that Jesus in his glorified physical body is there right now. He's there. When, when Christ in Acts 1 ascended into heaven, when he flew up into heaven, he went to a place. All right, Heaven is a place. I don't know where it is, but it is a place where Christ in his physical resurrected body ascended to. And he is there right now. His physical body is not in the Eucharist. It did not, it does not magically and miraculously become the bread and the wine, literally, like the Roman Catholic Church teaches. No, no, no. His physical body is in heaven, and when he returns, every eye shall see him. Not only is Christ there physically in his physical body, but Enoch is there in his physical body. As Genesis chapter 5 tells us that Enoch walked with God at 365 years old, and he was no more, for God took him. And so is Elijah in his physical body with the Lord, because the chariots of fire came and scooped Elijah and brought him in his physical body up into heaven. And not only that, when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he's there with Peter, James, and John, both Elijah and even Moses 
appears there. I don't know what that, how that's possible. Moses' body is somewhere. No one knows where it is. Okay, Moses' body is buried somewhere. It's, it's probably in our drinking water right now. It's turned into dust. Okay, but but there's Peter was there, and what Peter says on the top of the mountain, he says, "Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let me build three houses: one for you, and one for Moses." And one for Elijah, uh, let's just stay here forever. We never have to come down from this mountain. Why? Because on the top of that mountain, it was a taste of glory. That's what it was. He was, he was f f for a moment, this brief moment, as the veil is taken away from Christ and his face shone like the sun and his body, his clothes become white as light. That, that, it's, it's heaven. It's just heaven is there, right there. Peter doesn't want to, want to leave. And the Bible says he didn't know what he was talking about when he said that. It, if anyone wants to talk about an ecstatic utterance, that was an ecstatic utterance. Okay? Let us just live here forever. <laughs> That's it. He's, he's filled with the ecstasy of heaven, the joy and glory of heaven. On the top of the mountain. Hmm. So, then Moses died, right? Moses died. But what Jesus says is true. He died thousands of years ago. But he still appeared there on the mountaintop. After he died, not only did he appear, but miraculously... Peter even knew who he was. There were not photographs of Moses. Okay? Uh, Mark Chagall hadn't painted Moses yet. <laughs> so the, how, how did he know? I'll say something else. People ask this question. I've been asked this question before. Like, will we recognize each other in heaven? I don't see why not Peter recognized Elijah and Moses. Absolutely. I don't think we're going to get dumber when we're in heaven. We're going to have glorified minds. Absolutely. Uh, uh, when, when, when Paul says comfort each other with these words, it is with the knowledge of knowing that those who died before us in the Lord, that we will be together with them. That is comforting. That's what Paul says is comforting. We'll be with the Lord and we will be with our loved ones who have died in the Lord before us. Comfort each other with these words. Don't mourn like those who have no hope. You will see your Christian brethren again. That's the comfort that we have. So then, let's see what Jesus says. He says here, it's so great. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. That is, he will never see separation from the author of life. He will never see eternal separation from God. That is the ultimate thrust of the word death as Jesus uses it. Death is more than the separation of the soul from the body. It is the separation of the soul from God. That is what death is. And that is a far more important and far more scary thing than mere physical death. Far more. It is the reason why there is that common phrase, there are no atheists in foxholes. What does that mean? Well, it means that when they're in a foxhole, Shooting and bullets, zing, 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 winging past their heads. These people who may have said, oh, I don't believe in God. Suddenly they cry out, Lord, save me, have mercy on me, help me. Why? Why? Because fear has to do with judgment. That's why. That's what the Bible says. 
Fear has to do with judgment, and every single person on earth knows that they are a sinner. They know that they have broken God's law. They know that there is a God. They know that they have broken God's law. There is no such thing as a real, true atheist. Absolutely not. And what are they fearing when they're in the foxhole as the bullets are whizzing past? They're fearing this fact that is impressed upon every man. That is, it is appointed unto man once to die and after that to face the judgment. That's why. That's, that's imprinted, impressed upon the soul of every man. And yet for all of that, those who are in the temple here in John 8, they have no inclination, no ability to discern what Jesus is telling them. So the Jews said to him, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died also. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Yes, actually, that is exactly what Jesus is saying, that the man standing, standing in front of them in the temple is so much greater and higher than Abraham was as the heavens are above the earth. That's how much greater Jesus is than Abraham. <laughs> That's how much. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so Jesus is higher than Abraham, a man of the dust. And the fact that they ask him once again who he is, who does he make himself out to be, after he has already told them over and over and over, and I just gave you like six examples spaced out in this chapter about what Jesus says about himself, is simply proof that they wanted him to say something by which they could charge him with blasphemy. How ironic that these blasphemers are waiting for Jesus to blaspheme just like they do. If he did so, he would be just like them. And that's exactly what he says in the following verses. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, he is our God. And you have not come to know him. But I know him, and if I say that I do not know him, then I will be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. See how Jesus answers these wretched people. The very God that they claim to be the children of is the one who declares out of heaven at Jesus' baptism, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So then, the fact that they reject Jesus is the ultimate proof positive that they do not belong to God. They say they belong to God, but they do not trust in the one whom God has sent. That means they don't belong to him. If they loved God, they would love Jesus. If they loved God, they would serve Jesus. They would receive Jesus, just as Abraham did. Hmm. And Jesus says that if he says that he doesn't know the Father, well, then that would make him a liar. The very thing that he was incapable of being. Jesus is incapable of being a liar. Uh, look at the immaculate reasoning of Christ. It's astounding every single time I read it. Jesus cannot enter into any disputation without coming away the victor. Every single time. Ever. Remember when... <laughs> remember when his brothers... The text says his brothers did not believe in him and he went up to the, to the feast. They, they, were, they wanted him to go up and reveal himself, but he went up secretly and suddenly appeared in the temple. Remember how, how they didn't believe in him? I just have to... <laughs> wonder what that must have been like growing up um, in the Mary and Joseph household as every single time Jesus' brothers and sisters wanted to argue with him 
He always won the argument. <laughs> always. Always. Because he's the truth. He only ever speaks the truth. He cannot lie. He's the personification of truth. And the truth always prevails in the end. Jesus says that Abraham saw the day of the Lord. And that it made him glad. In Genesis 22, 18, the Lord said to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. When Abraham heard that, Jesus tells us he, he withdraws the veil even of Abraham's heart. He reveals the rejoicing inside of Abraham. He says, Abraham rejoiced when he was told that all the nations would be blessed through his seed, through his descendants. He understood that that meant that King Messiah would come from his lineage. And he was so joyful about that. He rejoiced. In Hebrews eleven thirteen, it tells us of those Old Testament saints who believed God's promises about the coming Messiah. All these died in faith, the author of Hebrews says, without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. That distance, they saw them from a distance, that refers there to the distance of time. Abraham lived 2,000 years before Christ. But God revealed to him that the Messiah would come through his offspring and bless the world. And this made him very glad. Of course he was glad that he, a child of the dust, would be the progenitor of the bloodline of King Jesus. How wonderful. Oh, if only the promise, if only the promise of the coming Messiah caused the saints of old to rejoice, then how much more the fulfillment? This is the reason why the Apostle Paul writes to the Philippian church and he says 13 times while he himself is in a prison, not even like a prison with bars and gates, but a hole in the ground. In the most wretched condition imaginable, there's not a bathroom. He has to go in the hole where he is. There's not a program where the Roman government is like, we need to provide this much money for the, these prisoners. Nope. If people are not bringing Paul food, if they're not bringing him parchments, if they're not bringing him warm jacket, then he will die he will die if they're not giving him these provisions. He has to rely on the blessing of God's people to bring him the things that he needs. It is in that context that he writes to the church at Philippi, Rejoice! And again I say, Rejoice! 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 Thirteen times in four chapters. Paul writes, Rejoice! Man, when I, when I think about that, it makes me so convicted of being such a grumbler. I'm such a grumbler. I complain about the weather. I complain about this and that. I complain we were, we were watching the Oregon Ducks game last night and and while we were watching the Ducks game, like the television froze all of a sudden, like television froze. I'm so angry right now. Like, oh, repent, David. Repent of that foolishness. No, rejoice. This is, yeah, this is it when you face trials of many kinds. For you know that your suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope that does not disappoint. It does not. It's so great. It's so marvelous. 
that we have the promise, the fulfillment of the promise. Christ has come. What else can we do but rejoice knowing that our Savior has come, that he has purchased our redemption, that this is the day of salvation, that Christ has appeared and brought us from darkness to light and from death to life. Abraham rejoiced at the mere promise of this unspeakable blessing. So then we must rejoice at the reception of it. What fools these people were for rejecting him. A fool is the only appropriate word that I can think of. Psalm 14.1. You know, in most Bibles, Psalm 14.1 is translated this way. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And surely it's true that those who say there is no God are that, fools. But if you look in the Hebrew of that text, it is not translated the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The actual Hebrew words say, the fool says in his heart, no God. That's it. That's what Psalm 14 one says. The fool says in his heart, no God. And he rejects God. That's exactly what's happening here. We must not be like these fools who were at the very gates of heaven itself and said, you are not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. Romans tells us every mouth will be stopped. Every mouth will be stopped because in the day of judgment there will be no excuse. The heart of every man will be laid bare. I cannot even imagine what it must have been what it must have been like for these very same people if they did not repent, perhaps 20, perhaps 30 years after this event that we're reading about in John's Gospel, chapter 8. Perhaps 30 years went by and they were laying on their deathbed and they struggled to take their last breath and suddenly the angels came to usher them to their abode in Hades. I wonder if they asked, where are you taking me? I'm a child of Abraham. Should I not go to Abraham's bosom? I wonder if perhaps the angel replied, no, for you tried to kill the one whom Abraham received. You rejected him while Abraham received him. And now the Lord whom you met in the temple that day, all those years ago, has declared, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. Maybe, maybe that's how it went for them. Maybe they repented of their unbelief. Only God knows. Listen then, as they reply to the king, verse 57 and on. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. And therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Here we behold one of the most profound statements ever uttered by the lips of the Savior. Jesus is referring here to God's call on one of Abraham's descendants, Moses, when Moses was working as a shepherd. And one day he was out in the field up, up on the mountains and, and he saw this most amazing sight a bush that was on fire, yet the fire was not consuming the bush. And the Lord was in the bush, and he called Moses to take his sandals from off of his feet, for the ground on which he was standing was holy ground. And he told Moses that he was going to be his chosen instrument to free the people of Israel from their bondage in Egypt. I want to read for you part of that marvelous conversation from Exodus 3, verses 13 to 15. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? And what shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus shall you say to the sons of Israel, 
I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. What is God's name forever and his memorial name to all generations? What is it? I am! This is God's name as God speaks to Moses out of the burning bush. And so here, Jesus finally answers this question. Who are you? Who are you, Lord? He is the great I am. Before Abraham was born, he says, Amen, amen. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Only Jesus can say that. Only he can do it. He is the one. This is what he's saying. That he is the one who spoke to Moses in the burning bush. I am is God's name forever. It is his memorial name to all generations. This means that Jesus is here definitively without any mistake about it. He is declaring that he is God of very God. That is what he is doing here in John 8. Any, any uh, time you have a Jehovah's Witness who comes to your door and tries to spout their heretical Aryan nonsense, saying that Jesus is a created being who is less than God, you can just direct them right here to the end of John chapter 8, and show them this is what Jesus says about himself. That he is the great I am. Before Abraham was born, Jesus is the I am. He is the everlasting one. He is the alpha and the omega. The beginning and the end. Hallelujah. Let heaven and earth bow before him. His is the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord. Amen. If you believe it, say amen. amen. Jesus is the Lord of glory. He is. He is. Oh, that these men finally understood what Jesus was saying in that moment. They finally understood it. Do you know how we know that they understood it? Because they picked up rocks to throw at him. That's the reason why. They wanted to murder him. Why? Because they thought that he was blaspheming. This word, this word, before Abraham was born, I am this word finally broke through their granite skulls. It broke through. And they picked up stones to murder the righteous one. But it was not yet the time. We're, we're only in John 8. It was not yet the time. And the Lord escaped their hand. But you know though, the fact that they didn't bow their knee in that moment does not mean that they never will. It does not mean that. Romans 14, 11. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue shall confess to God. All will do so in the resurrection of the just and the unjust. All will. All will, I say. All will is what God says. But the question is, will you do so now? That's the question. We will all bow the knee. But will you bow the knee today? Today is the day of salvation. Here we see again this, this very clear separation. The separation between those who believe in Christ, who know Christ, who trust in him, and thus today, right now, bow the knee to him. And those who reject his very, very clear, perspicuous word, 
We cannot be confused about who he claims to be. We can only either receive him or reject him. That's it. Those are the two positions. Oh, I've said it before. I want to say it one more time. There's only two positions that a person can ever be in. They can neither be a person whom Isaiah says in chapter 53, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. They can be a person who receives the blood of Jesus upon them, and that by his blood we have atonement. I was just teaching this week on Noah's flood and how God told Noah to cover the ark in kafar, which is translated as pitch, and in every other place in the Bible, that Hebrew word for pitch that is used there is the word atonement. Atonement. Kafar is atonement. And, and what did the pitch serve to do? The, the tar that he covered the ark with, it kept out the flood and waters of God's judgment. It kept out the water. For an entire year of them being on the boat, it kept out the water of judgment. When, when uh, we were just looking at the end of this, when, when uh, of the of the of the flood narrative in my class teaching sixth and seventh grade Bible here at CLA, that when the ark finally rested on Mount Ararat, and it had not been raining for a long time, and they're in the ark and. Noah sends out a raven, and then he, he sends out a dove. And the dove flies around, and the dove comes back, and he it hops onto his finger, and he brings it back in. And then he waits another week, and he sends the dove out again. And then the dove comes and brings back an olive leaf, which is why the olive leaf, the olive branch, and the dove is the universal sign for peace. Peace. Why do you, why do you think the Holy Spirit appeared as a dove and descended upon Jesus at his baptism? Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace, that's why. And, and even after the dove came back and brought the olive leaf to Noah, Noah knew that the floodwaters had ceased, he still stayed in the ark for another week. Like, why? Because he knew that in that ark there was safety. Alright, that's why. In the ark there was safety. God, God had to say to him, Leave the ark. <laughs> he did. He told Noah and his family that. Leave now. That blood that was shed for us, it has the power to be our atonement. He is the Passover lamb. He is the one, if we have his blood upon us, death passes over us. When we have Jesus, we will never see death. That's what Isaiah 53 shows us. He, he died for our sins. His blood is upon us. But then just 10 chapters later in Isaiah 63, it says, who is this who is coming from Edom? His, his robes are crimson. They're red like one who treads in the wine press. And the bottom of their robes gets stained by the blood of the grapes as they're treading in the wine press. It is I, mighty to save. Why are your robes red? I have come from trampling down the nations. Their lifeblood splattered on all of my garments. That's what the Lord says. So that every single person on the earth who ever lived either has the blood of Jesus covering them or else their blood will cover him. Those are the two positions. That's all there is. There is no middle ground. Either Christ's blood covers us or our blood will cover him. Which one, which position are you in? All you must do is trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in his shed blood on our behalf and have life. Amen. Let us pray.
Our great and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you that Jesus declares that he is the great I Am. That Jesus is the one who is speaking to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3. All these blind people, they, they rejected him, but Lord... Let every single person within the sound of my voice right now receive him and believe in him and trust in him. You've proved yourself in so many ways and so many times. And you've been so patient with us, Lord, even when we've acted like fools. You've been so patient with us and you love us so much, Lord, and we're so, so grateful for that. I pray that you save those that we love. I pray that you would hear and answer our prayers that maybe some of us have prayed for many years. That our loved ones would come to you, that they would have faith in you, Lord. Hear those prayers. Soften their hearts right now. Draw them to yourself. Give them the atonement that can only come from the blood of Jesus. Lord, soften each of our hearts to believe in you and to follow you. Let us not be afraid at all for the, uh, the vain and empty threats of the world. Lord, just as we heard today, there might be terrorist threats in the world. What can they do? Kill the body and then do no more. No, we fear him who has the power to throw both body and soul into hell. That is the only one we fear, Lord. Keep our eyes on you, Lord. Help us to know that if we have you, the world cannot do anything to us. Lord, I thank you for each of the souls that you've brought here today. Please bless each one of them to know you and to follow you until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing hymn number 216, Crown Him with many crowns. And as we, as, we, as we sing this, I'll tell you one more thing about Martin Lloyd-Jones. Once he was being interviewed and he said this, Sometimes I feel the fact that we sing all of these hymns and, and we, perhaps we don't even know or pay attention to what we're saying. Now, if you're going to sing it, you must pay attention to it. Pay attention to the words that you're singing. Don't sing them if you don't mean them. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 216. Crown him with many crowns. The Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. And hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends his burning eye at mystery. So bright. Crown him the Lord of peace, whose power a scepter sways. From pole to pole, let wars may cease, absorbed in prayer and praise. His reign shall know no end, and around his pierced feet, fair flowers of paradise extend their fragrance ever sweet. Crown him the Lord of years, the potentate of time. 
Creator of the rolling spheres, ineffably sublime. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise shall never, never fail throughout eternity. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. May God be with you all.